Yeah, good morning, everybody. So welcome to the roundtable discussion here with the New Breed of Business. Um, I'm Greg, uh, and uh, I want to welcome everyone else here who's on the call. We've got Doug and Don and Lucienne and Mary and Lois and Merrick and DJ. And uh, thanks, guys, for joining us today. Um, the topic is part two of what does it mean to come out of Babylon? And all I'm going to try to do is set up and frame a discussion. Um, I'm going to express my views and opinions, and I'm not claiming that it's um, the gospel, but hopefully I'm uh, aligning myself as we're aligning ourselves with the Lord and the Holy Spirit and, and what's going on. So I wanted to share as part of that a little more of how we as a family came out of Babylon and some of the dreams and understandings and I guess um, the dynamics of what went on, the history of how that happened. And if you guys want to share some of your testimony too, uh, that can contribute to that, please do. Uh, but if you remember last time, uh, I mentioned these two practical steps that in 2009, when we ran out of all of our resources, our money, our credit and everything else, and God said, keep going and trust me. And that was confirmed in so many ways. Uh, Lois, remember Alan Hayes's admonition on All Saints Day when we prayed all night through the night. He had this word about trusting God no matter what. And it was a total confirmation what the Lord said. Uh, and he told me that I actually got that for you, Greg, even though I was giving it to the whole congregation. And it was so affirming because we were in such a precarious position seeing that financial cliff coming. Um, so those two practical steps were, uh, just as a reminder, um, no more debt and pray instead of using your own strength or asking someone for help. And those two steps were critical for us to quote, come out of Babylon. I didn't understand all of why that was coming out of Babylon quite yet, but it was part of it because the Lord had given a vision and given a purpose and a plan and a ministry that, um, uh, for what to do. And so I changed the whole direction of National Hall Capital and what we were doing ministry-wise and vocationally and kind of creating this hybrid that we talk about as the new breed. Uh, but when, but my idea of faith was like, when we ran out of money, then the check would arrive and God would helicopter in the capital and the business engines would restart and we would go, go, go. And we'd be off to the races, create a profit and then do some good work with the profits. So that's not what happened, but it was this process. And one of the things that the Lord brought to my recollection was he prepped me for this in the summer of 2008. And what happened was I had a dream. Uh, I was up on Cape Cod. And in the dream, I'm in this vast ocean. I'm alone. I have no vessel, no anything. I'm just in the ocean swimming. And I see the biggest tidal wave I've ever seen in my life. And it's coming right at me. And it was like a tsunami wave. It was huge. It was like over 100 feet kind of deal. And when this thing was coming at me, I was like, there's the only one way I can get through this. And that's to dive deep, 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 deep down beneath that wave and try to survive it. And then it go over the top of me. So I did that in this dream and I made it through to the other side. And when I woke up, I heard the Lord say, it's going to be a while, two years. And so I was like, what, what does this mean? What does this mean? Like, and you know, many people get um, things like this and they think, oh, well, waves are waves of revival. And well, maybe it's a positive thing, but I was like, yeah, but there was something about it that was like a survival deal. And it was like, really had to just, I was hanging on for dear life. And little did I know that those two years coming up, which started in 09 through 011, were some of the toughest times in our life financially. But God got us through and he taught us these new ways and these new tricks. And part of the reason I'm telling this is because today we're talking about what are some of the practical things to come out of Babylon further. Um, and I'm just sharing some of this stuff because I think God was weaving it through um, my experience for those 20 years, starting in 2001, where I probably mentioned to you guys that that was the first thing I heard 
in 2001, part of 9-11, right before it was this Isaiah 52 passage, um, which is the come out of Babylon passage of the Old Testament. That's when that was speaking to the Israelites coming out of Babylon to rebuild the temple, but it also has a double meaning, a type and shadow meaning further out into the future, which is God's people to always come out of Babylon or come out of Babylon according to Revelation 18. So the parallel passages are Isaiah 52, uh, 2 Corinthians 6, and Revelation 18. They all say the same thing. It all basically says, my people, you've got to consecrate yourself, come out of these practices, come out, divorce yourself from these foreign gods and wives and practices, and touch no unclean thing. That's like a reference to idolatry. So don't, you've got to leave behind all idolatry. You got to leave behind all these ways and you've got to come apart and be separate. So that leads us into our discussion today. What does this separation mean? Clearly, we were not told to separate ourselves from the world. Like, okay, we'll just go into a spacecraft and build this utopian culture uh, up in, in orbit. That's not what Jesus was saying. Of course, our whole gospel is about setting the captives free and helping others, right? So the only way we can do that is to be here. Um, but we, but we're basically commanded, like, listen, you've got to come out of those practices because if you don't, you're going to be ensnared. You're going to be enslaved. You're going to be tripped up. You're going to be fearful. You're not going to be, you're going to project your fear on others at the very time I need you to be my rescuers and my rescue team. So that's part of the reason why this is so important of coming out of Babylon is we don't want our strings attached to the devil's schemes and the kingdom of Babylon. The kingdom of Babylon is nothing more than the kingdom of darkness. There's the kingdom of God and there's the kingdom of Babylon. If you want to look at it simply, you can call it other names. You could call it the Antichrist. You could call it Egypt. You could call it Sodom. You could call it all the biblical names for alignment with the kingdom of darkness. But wherever we have those strings attached to us, it limits our effectiveness as the church. So when we went through all that, Lois would know that we were praying for keeping the firehouse offices because we used it as a ministry center and a unity center and a prayer center. So much good was done there. So we were praying that we'd be able to keep the offices in spite of the financial uh, struggle and financial challenges and troubles. And it didn't happen. And right after we lost the offices, that was September of 2010, and this was the second time that I had personally participated in a divorce bail process. There's a fellow by the name of John Benefield. He's Apostle John Benefield of HAPN. He's out of Oklahoma. He and Dutch Sheets were focused very intently and others on this uh, idea, John and Julie Hamill, for example, this idea of coming out of um, divorcing bail, that bail which is, by the way, the chief Canaanite god, which is tied into Babylon, and Bel is the chief uh, god of Babylon, but it's all one and the same thing. Who's hiding behind the curtain of all that stuff? It's not the Wizard of Oz, it's the devil. So um, anyhow, we went down to D.C. to do this divorce bail process with a group from Connecticut in March of 2010, but we were meeting up with 50 states, and one of the things that happened in that dynamic was this really great practice. Um, and by the way, there's a legal decree that you sign, a kind of type of vow that's part of this. I put links to that into the email. And you can see some of the links also on the website, uh, newbreed.co. So this process was this commitment. And having gone through what we had gone through, being a part of this, at the end of it, I almost experienced what was like a golden calf molding and jumping around experience because after we divorced bail, everyone started talking about and whooping it up about the transfer of wealth. We're going to get all the money. We're going to get all the gold. And it was the craziest thing. Um, it, and I reason I'm bringing it up is because I knew, wait a second, this is out of sync. Like we did the right thing to divorce bail but we're jumping right back in again by worshiping this golden calf. So um, later we did a, another process to divorce bail in Connecticut. And I did that with a number of leaders throughout Connecticut. We prayed in the basement and the foundations of the Capitol 
these prayers. And that was when I personally signed this document. In fact, I have it right here. Every time I have a financial challenge or have to uh, do something the Lord is asking me, I, I carry this document around, which is signed in 2010, 9-9-2010. Um, that was literally the day after we got evicted from the firehouse. And, um, and it was part of this, the Lord moving me to come out of Babylon. Greg, this is something I want you to vow. This is something I want you to do. This is important to me. This is part of consecration and setting apart. And I didn't, you know, again, I didn't fully understand it, but I understood it enough to believe in it and to make the commitment. We've modified that document a little bit to include mammon. So it's not just divorcing bail. It's also mammon because it's our, that's the economic focus as well in the recognition of that golden calf episode. So um, all that happened within these two years, this tsunami wave, and we made it. We came out the other side. Uh, Lois would also remember Jennifer Richley. Jennifer and Philip Richley were leaders in our church. They moved down to Texas, but before that happened, she had this word about um, this prophetic word about me crossing through this muddy pond, getting to the other side with Jesus and my family waiting. And basically I had to put one foot in front of the other. And I was wearing these yellow rubber boots and I sank down, but she said, you won't drown. And I think she gave us that prophetic word, probably at the beginning of 2009. Um, they, they turned around having left church and came back and it was I didn't know what to make of it, to be honest with you, when that first happened. But then later, it started falling into place and understanding, okay, I'm going to go through this extraction process. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be this tsunami wave. But the, deep, the diving deep represents into the spiritual things of God. Deep talks to deep. That scripture that says, like, go deeper. As I went deeper in trusting God and believing and having faith, I was able to survive this gigantic tsunami wave. And I think that those kind of economic tsunami waves, and it was financial for us, are coming to the earth greater and greater. And if we're not ready, if the church is still built on sand, if we're still wedded to all of our uh, financial apparatuses to provide for us, we're not going to be able to make it. I mean, basically the lesson there was I didn't need anything other than just trusting God. I, I didn't need anything other than God himself, and he got us through. So there are many systems, there are many alternative currencies, there are many ways of, of creating these things to, to provide a, a heavenly alternative system. But if we don't have that trust and heart from the get-go, it can never work, either individually or collectively in community. Because we'll constantly be going back to Egypt. And all you've got to do is look back biblically when the Israelites went through the wilderness and see how they were tempted at every turn. And when they came out of Babylon, they were tempted at every turn. Remember, the Israelites were charging the other Israelites interest and in lending. And it was like a whole racket that got going that was all back in those practices. And uh, the leaders and the prophetic leaders had to stand up and say, no. This is wrong. The word of God says, do not do that. Um, and likewise, we had the Korah of rebellion, the, the rebellion of Korah and all those other things that happened in the desert. Uh, Moses being rebelled against, but even his own siblings. Um, so there's always that temptation. There's always that, how long will you falter between two opinions? Scripture is, if, if Baal's your God, then serve him. If Jehovah's your God, then serve him. And as things get harder, economically and these things get judged and start to fail like revelation 18 says that's how we prepare um so i wanted to just set it up that way um i'll say one more final thing that if you look at the history of the pilgrims and how the united states was founded before they signed the mayflower compact before they set sail on the speedwell and the mayflower and had to turn the speedwell around they made a deal and the reason I'm bringing this up is because they did a deal with Babylon, the merchant adventurers, to get to the other side. But it was a snare to them. They were enslaved to the deal. They got manipulated 
by the deal. There was a fellow by the name of Thomas Weston. They brokered this thing. They negotiated. They came up with a contract. They created a corporation. And all the capital came in from investors who were not Christians per se. They were just people looking for a profit. And they basically signed themselves up to indentured servitude for seven years. And then it got worse after that because they couldn't get all the furs, the lumber, and the resources that were expected. They were in debt. They were in trouble. And um, it was really a tension between, well, who are you serving? You're serving that requirement of your contract and the, and the, and the producing of the, of the profit, or are you serving God and we're planting a new place here? So clearly we know they were serving God. They were trying to set up this new life, and we have much to be thankful for for the pilgrims. But that seed there was, I feel, just as an opinion, was a seed for what then later became Babylon within America and all of the systems we've created now of profiteering. That same merchant adventurer profiteering spirit is with us today, and it's enslaving people yet again. So um, I'm just going to open this up now, talk about and we can you can ask any questions you'd like about what I've shared, or if you have your own stories to share. Um, point being, like this divorce, bail, mammon was super important for coming out of Babylon for me. Maybe it is for you. Check out this vow. What does it mean? Would I want to do something like that? And one final point that I put in there was I also had, uh, clearly there was a repentance process of like, Lord, I have been trusting my own self. I have been trusting my own money. I have been trusting in more than just you. I admit it. Um, so that was the, that style of repentance. But then the Lord said to me, you need to do that in public now because private was good. But for my purposes, I need you to repent in public. And Lois might have even been there for that because that was the National Day of Prayer in 2011, um, which was the almost to the end of those two years, that two-year period, on the Veterans Green of Westport. Basically, I repented uh, from trusting in mammon, trusting in self, you know, trusting in other things other than God. Um, and I say it because there was it was I was commanded to do it, and so it was like. I had this dream where I was in a bathroom and I wanted to have my privacy going to the bathroom. And the Lord said, no, you have to go outside into the hallway. Um, and, you know, bathrooms can represent in dream interpretation and, and some symbolism, cleansing. So cleansing and repentance, um, washing up, you know. Um, and so I had to, I was shown like, you've got to do this in public. So there's a power in the public declaration of our repentance. The, the, the Bible says, when you confess your sins to one another, then I will forgive you. And so there's a power in that to, to confess to others, to repent to others, and even repent to um, in public. So th that's what I felt led to share this morning. Uh, there's a lot there, but anybody who wants to uh, riff on that or or question it or pick it apart, like feel free. Craig, I just want to say that when I've heard this, first of all, I just like, I want to join the chorus of the others thanking you for sharing this because some of us may have had versions or aspects of this and it's, it, it codifies, it helps solidify in these documents, they do speak to the governance side of the kingdom of God, also in a sense that we're in, not the ceremony per se, but the fact that we're dealing with an actual kingdom here. I, I have come to experience it as a monarchy. We might look like a republic outwardly. We make decisions that seems good to us and the Holy Spirit is really the way that it is to roll. Even when prophets are present, there has to be a second one that if they have something, which they will, the first one listens, and then the third, and so on. And we judge. We judge with the righteous judgment of God. We listen to the decrees of God. And it resonates. It has, it has that ring to it. 
And I do want to say those who are here also, I'm are sure are well aware of the fact that to come to these places and, and even do what you've done, it's through many sufferings and a lot of pain that we enter into the kingdom of God, the life of the kingdom. Even when he said to Paul, he, 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 he pressed upon him what would be his whole life. He said, I will show him how great things he will suffer for my name's sake. He'll come before kings and other people like that, but there's a suffering. And I just want to, I just want, if I could just take, because I think it goes right along with this, because to come out of Babylon, from my experience, has all, has involved for me, along with, I know all of us, intense a for what it could be for an American, a lot of suffering. And the reason why that is, is because among other reasons, that relationship is there in this divorce to be, and the intimacy reaches beyond, quite frankly, I've been married for decades. It reaches beyond the greatest of physical intimacies that one can know with another human being in this life that that marriage in this sense of the bride you, you this especially with this certificate here you don't just see these words greg because this hasn't been brought just because there's knowledge to be aware that this is a good thing god has to and i and i want to stress this a lot because i think it's so god has to draw you in he has to draw us into this and we can't write the script really for our lives for this. He, he has to ordain the experiences, the relationships. It, it's, it's devastating some of the things when you even think of the song, It Is Well With My Soul. And uh, I forget who the writer was, but it, he had that tragic trip where he didn't go and he lost his, he lost his wife, he lost, or, or whatever, he lost his daughters. I mean, this is, this is beyond devastating stuff. To, to come to the place of it's well with my soul is impossible if it's not, if it's not well with my soul. And the other thing too is because we have a kingdom and because we are soldiers, athletes is what God told me a number of years ago, five years. He said, okay, you've had it too easy. He said, that body that you live in there, that belongs to me. I want that body. And I didn't understand what that all meant. I didn't understand these long fasts and all these things that would come into play that never had gone to those. But there's a warfare because what Greg, what I see, this stuff, we, God, can I say it in the most beautiful way? He weaponizes, he doesn't weaponize us, but we become, we become weapons also in the hand of God, our life, our prayers, our relationship with God, because the love affair is so swept away that you know what I'm talking about. You're sometimes woken up in the middle of the night, you're whatever, and you're just like, it's like your lover wants to engage you. And what can you do? You come to where, how do I say no to this one that is doing this to my life, spirit, soul, and body. I have no, I could, but where do I go? Who, who, how can I turn away from him? How can I deny him? I find myself running the streets. You get beat up along the way, find it, like coming out of this because you're coming against, you're a weapon against the powers of darkness. So coming out of Babylon makes you an absolute bad word, but my kids like it, savage enemy against your former entanglements. You, you, you walk in the love of God, but the love of God elevates to where it gets, I'll put it this way, against the powers of hell, behind the scenes, let's say, we get nasty and mean because you're tampering with the love of my life. And on top of that, you're tampering with these people's souls that are going to go to hell that some of us still believe in a literal heaven, in a literal hell. 
even though there's the onslaught of all this proliferation of heresy in the earth, which we're coming against, not just by words, but by power. And Greg, so I, I when I think of Philippians 3, what came to mind was Philippians 3.10, and I'm just going to, from the new um, American standard, it says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death. And when I see what you're talking about, and I, we could read that whole that whole chapter, but that chapter builds up to the fact that basically this relationship has taken him, separated him from everything, all his relation, including himself. It's not that we won't get him back, but it's almost like we have to be taken out of everything. It's not, it's everything. It's every relationship. Jesus said, if you love other brother, sister, wife, children more than me, you're not worthy of me. You're not worthy of me. And he also said, there's no one that's forsaken or abandoned, Mark 10, 29 and 30. All these relationships, children, wife, lands for my sake in the gospels, but he'll receive a hundredfold. So when I think of the massive, God showed me the massive turning of the kingdom, of wealth and the kingdoms of this world, it's like the foundation relationally with the king to be living in that space for him to be able to turn that over. That's that foundation. It'll destroy us if, if we don't have it. But I do want to say, Greg, the suffering that comes out is, is, as you've testified, is so worth it. Whatever we give up by lifestyle or anything else, he says he'll give it back hundredfold. And I jokingly be married over 30 years with my wife. Sometimes I've said, I've, I've joked with her. I've said, no, if you look at Matt, Mark 10, 29 and 30, the one relationship that doesn't come back is the wife. It says you forsake mother, brother, sister, children, wife, plants. And I said, but what you get back instead of the wife are persecutions. You get a hundredfold back with persecutions. And I used to jokingly say, is there just God trying to show me something? I said, there's, there's a couple easier. ways of interpreting that one. I know persecutions. That. <laughs> Anyways, I'll leave it on a funny note. So you list, let me try to summarize real quick, kind of some of the points you're making here. Number one, expect to go through sufferings, expect to go through persecutions. If we're obeying the Lord, that's just part of the part of the way here on earth in this good versus evil battle. I think one of the deceptions in the um, prosperity understanding or the comfort understanding of Christianity is, hey, just believe and then God is your person who takes care of you and, and does everything for you with you and stuff. So there is God's grace, but then there's the sufferings and you, we do have to go through those. And then the other point I think you're making is that everyone's different. God has a unique plan for everyone. So you might be inspired by my story or the tools that I used. But what's really important is what is the Lord saying to you with integrity? And what is he asking us all to do collectively in terms of this coming out? What does it mean? So it'll always look a little different, but it will never be a compromised version. Like, well, I'll come out of this, but I'll hold back on God on that. That's the thing you got to always watch out for is we've got to do the whole deal um, not the Burger King. I'll do it my way. You know, I like that one, God, but not that. That suffering's not for me. That's no good for me. You know, we just—it's almost part of that letting go and trusting God when we say, "Hey, you know me best, Lord. I trust you. I'm never going to suffer beyond what I can stand. So, I'm just putting myself in your hands. I'm letting go. I'm dying to myself. I'm, I'm letting go of control." I'm letting go of my notions of what I want, and I want to want what you want. That's sort of the the key, the key premise there. Anyone else want to share their testimony or um, what? Any questions you might have, or you know, what do you guys think? Uh, Donna Jean, you got your hand up. Go right ahead, and let's let's try to keep it to you know a few minutes so that everyone can share too. Um, I want to say three separate things. 
one is, as you get to know me, you know, I'm the practical, how do we make it happen, get her done kind of thinking. So number one, to me, the, the, the practicality is the whole debt question. And this is what I'm screaming from the mountaintops. All of us need to get out of debt. Whatever personal debt we have, even mortgages, get out of debt, get out of debt, get out of debt. That's probably the, the key way we can start breaking ourselves out of Babylon. Number two, now I'm, I'm, a, I'm a widow now, but uh, currently, and I raised six kids, so cur currently uh, this doesn't really apply to me now, but uh, when I was married, and this is for people who are married, Getting on the same page, getting on the same page. Boy, there's a struggle right there. I mean, that's, I had a husband I didn't know at the time was actually addicted to spending. And I, I was the other way, you know, whatever it took to stay out of debt. And he was doing signature loans behind my back and re re using credit cards and racking them up and I'm clueless. And, finding stuff squirreled away that he bought and not even used. Uh, so it became a real strain on my marriage because we were not on the same page at all. We were so far not on the same page that I'm doing everything I could stay to stay out of debt. And he was spending so much without my agreement and then finally without my knowledge because he just is as if he couldn't stop himself. So behind my back. He actually went bankrupt while we were married. And somehow, and this is where we really do have to trust in God that if we hold the stand that God puts in our heart, somehow he's going to take care of things because it doesn't make sense that I'm married to this man. He, he runs up all this debt. He goes bankrupt, but somehow my credit stayed sterling. There's things that the only way I can explain it is when I when I take a stand with God and I'm totally convinced that I've heard him, I'm willing to just stand in the storm with him. Somehow he works out those details that we would want to worry about, like, well, what if, what if, what if? I, I put the what ifs aside and just say, just put the blinders on. I think some was a great, don't look to the left or the right. Don't look, just don't look, just keep focused on what God has put in our heart. So that's number two. Now, number three is, and I, I think it's touched on about the idea of, uh, and all this, of course, is going to be suffering to our human flesh, but it's going to be worth it. Freedom is so worth it. Being in the Lord's plan for our life is so worth it. But the aspect of, and I think you quoted of um, uh, uh, in John, Anyways, the whole thing about we're in the world, but not of it. And coming out of the world means we're not of it. And if the world loves you, then something's wrong. So facing the idea of being different. The idea of being different is scary. I mean, it's the one thing that, that seems to be giving everyone mental problems. Oh, I can't be different from the crowd. I can't be different because then that slides into persecutions. So I, I, part of not just the suffering of what the lifestyle looks like of coming out of Babylon, how do we rearrange things economically and all that is added on top of it. And it's one of the hardest things for a human being to face, the fear of rejection, the fear of rejection for being different. And we're talking about being different in a very big way. And we have to deal with that fear of rejection in our soul and be so rooted in God's love for us and the security of we are really doing what God wants us to do. That when we're rejected and persecuted, we'd love to be in a place where it's just water off a duck's back. That's yeah, so... Um... I can totally appreciate that and the peer pressure point because it's a major fear. Fear is a big debilitating thing for all of us that we've got to face down and deal with and, and just stare it at, the, at it with faith and trust God. I want to pick up on your point number two, which is what about my spouse? I believe this, but my spouse believes that. 
I appreciate Merrick and Mary right now being on this uh, call together because they are there. They are together. They are together in their pursuit of whatever God is calling them to pursue along these lines. And that is so vital because if we're not equally yoked and we're not together in a thing, it will destroy us. And I have to give all credit to Bridget because as part of what we went through, I keep saying family, family. This was not just Greg and Greg's notion. This was us as a family. The family was put at risk. Many people said to me, this is crazy. You have young children. You shouldn't do this. You should go back to Wall Street, get that job, make that money. You have a responsibility to your family. You've got to take care of those young kids. And look, a mother appreciates that more than anyone, right? A mother wants to make a home and a place to raise their kids. And it's like a bird with making a nest. It's really important. So we had many wrestlings with God, tearful times through those sufferings. Where are we in it together? And I, I remember, I'll even share this. There was one point where uh, we were both pulling our hair out in tears. And, um, you know, and, and, and so I, I remember saying something to Bridget like, um, look, if you can't trust me in what's going on, just trust God. And if you can't trust God, well, you could trust me. I'm trying to trust God, but that's all I've got for you. Though. All I've got is either you can trust me to trust God or trust God on your own or both or a combination, but that's all we can do because there's no, there is no other way. There's no other hope. And if we have that hope for eternity, that resurrection hope forever, we have to have it to face the difficult things of life. And we do have to come together as husband and wife and family to do it. Uh, so I have to give all credit, even more than myself, to Bridget because of this, because it's harder to trust in something you didn't necessarily directly experience with God. So I'm sharing this dream, this vision, this happened, that happened. Bridget had things like that happen too, but Oh, in a lot of cases, she was having to like listen to my passionate pleas about the Lord is saying as a family, we need to do what Joshua said. Uh, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And, you know, look, she, God bless her as a, as a leader herself. And Lois knows this. She really embraced um, this to the full. And this is super critical because if you try to do it like one person thinks one thing and the other one's staying in babylon watch out it can rip a family apart lois go ahead <laughs> i have to say a wonderful word on behalf of bridget um you were back in church sunday for the first time after being away for quite a while but we knew that you needed that time away as a family so she came back to church and she, the first thing she did after the service, she reached out to this young teenage girl who's really at risk of going off the rails. And she said the most wonderful things to this girl, young girl, and um, that she needs to study hard. And even if it's a course she doesn't like, she needs to work hard at that. And, um, and it said all kinds of encouraging things to this girl. And how do I know this? Because I gave this young girl a ride home. And she was in the back seat and she said, oh, I really like Bridget Healy. She's, she really encouraged me. She said, this, 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 and this. And she said, um, I hope I'm not taking too much time on your wife. But anyway, I have to brag about your wife, George. Um, and, she, and, she, and then she said to me, she said, now, I, I won't give her name, but she said, now, and Bridget said to this young girl, she said, now, my daughter just moved to California. And she said, don't do this to your mother. <laughs> and so anyway, I get all the stories from this girl who was in the back seat of my car who I gave a ride home to. And um, so I need Bridget's email when you get off. You send it to me because I need to tell her. But it was the most wonderful thing because I've been, I've been encouraging this young girl all along. And I, I, I felt that I wasn't making any headway. I mean, she was just doing things that... I, I had run out of ideas, but Bridget stepped in and filled the gap. And this girl was just full of plans for her own future, her career, 
what she's going to study. Uh, she's going to study forensics. And, you know, I mean, Bridget, whatever Bridget said to her was like just what she needed to hear. And, you know, Bridget has her own burden that she's carrying, right, of sadness. Um, but she reached out to another teenager. And, um, you know, I just want to cry because she, um, she was God first, Greg. And um, anyway, I just want to say that. Yes, she does. I appreciate you saying that, Lois. And it's so great that you're a witness to some of the stuff. And um, yeah, she is an excellent woman. She is a Proverbs 31 woman. And um, before I depart from this family matter, the suffering we experienced that was the worst was when people who were Christians turned against us and said, what you're doing is wrong. And that was so difficult because we knew that we were hearing the Lord and trying to obey him. That was hard enough to have a faith to do that. And then when people disagreed and even wanted to uh, come after us, um, really, if you think about it, it's often out of people's own fears. Um, they come after you and say, you can't do that because if I ever had to do that, like I would pull my hair out. So it, it, it's weird. Like, but the key of it was, and this I think is really instructive, and Merrick will remember this. I gave him the same story uh, once. God said, don't leave the church. Don't leave what, where I've planted you. You just got to love on people. They don't understand. That's okay. Just put up with it and stay and, and, and remain and remain planted. And um, you know what? It took a long time for things to come back around, um, but they did. And people uh, respected some of those things and some some others maybe don't talk about it because it's too hard to talk about. But um, anyway, it worked. It all worked out in the end. And I think that's a part of this is that as we come out of Babylon, as we obey God and others are not necessarily in that place for doing it. If you're pioneering, for example, one of the keys in all of that is, hey, listen, God is doing something with you that you can then in turn help others. Remember John the Baptist, he was sent to do what? To prepare the way of the Lord. He was doing stuff that other people were not. And then other people entered into that later. And the disciples of John became the disciples of Christ. And so sometimes we're called to do a thing that flies in the face of that peer pressure that DJ talked about. It can even come from our brothers and sisters because they may not have that same revelation. But ultimately, in love, we're putting up with whatever we got to per get persecuted on or suffer for in, a, in, in to be an enduring witness to what God wants to do. And in the end, it'll all work itself out. And, and sometimes it doesn't, of course, like Peter was hung upside down and Paul suffered and died in Rome. But it's OK because they did what was right, you know, no matter what happened. And God will always use that and turn it to the good. I'm convinced. <clears throat> yeah, we can, uh, let's save that to the end. Don's suggesting let's have a time of prayer for marriages. Um, anybody else want to uh, share who uh, hasn't shared yet? And please uh, go ahead, unmute and uh, share a perspective or your own testimony or anything else. And then uh, once we give that, a chance, then we can come back to you, DJ. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I just been really, it's been a fa fascinating conversation as they all are. I, I mean, I just love to hear everybody's perspectives and see kind of the thread that's that the Holy Spirit's kind of bringing forth um, through everybody's experiences. And you, you know, you got most of you guys heard my testimony. Um, <laughs> A few weeks ago, so I won't go through that again. But um, some of the things, Greg, that you said early on, uh, a couple of points you made, um, you and I think you and Don both kind of mentioned this ringing out process that happens that when you go through these trials, it really kind of almost purges you from, from the connection that we have to man's systems. And that's a process that is both painful but necessary because we cannot create something new 
uh, when we're entangled with Babylon systems and the traditions of men, because we, we'll, we either carry that in as leaven, or we simply will not see it at all, and we'll just recreate something that is of man and put a Christian label on it, <laughs> and that just isn't going to work. Um, so, you know, it, it's it's building things to your point, Greg, that you made very early on in terms of we want to lead people out of where they're at into the kingdom, but we can't lead them into something that doesn't exist. Now, the spiritual aspect of the kingdom of God exists. We understand that, but we're, what we're talking about, and you know, to DJ's point, there's a practical uh, series of systems that need to be built here on the earth in order for his kingdom to be manifest in a way that people will see it, and we can lead them into something that protects them from them being entangled and drawn back into Babylon. And those things are what we see don't exist yet. And a big part of the conversations we're having is, okay, how do we create those things? So, um, you know, I kind of found that interesting. Um, let's see, there's another point Don made. Oh, you use the word weaponize. I think that's a good one. <laughs> because weapons can be used uh, both for good and for ill. But, you know, uh, scripture's pretty clear. You know, our weapons are not carnal. We have weapons. We have been weaponized but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds and imaginations and, and all those things that set themselves against him and his kingdom. So I'm totally comfortable with the term weaponized. And I think we should get comfortable with that too and not let others um, kind of push us away from, from that kind of talk. I mean, we have to make sure we're couching into the right context because there are folks out there that are getting a little bit loose with that term, but but this is, a, this is a war. And then finally, DJ's point of kind of being lonely and uh, persecuted and, and those kind of things. I just looked at uh, a scripture that, Greg, you sent out uh, as part of the email, uh, John 17, 14, and 15. The world has hated them because, of, because they're not of the world. <laughs> That's what you're talking about, DJ. That's what we're all experiencing to one degree or another. But it continues, just as I am not of the world, I do not pray that you should be, that you should take them out of the world, but it should keep them from the evil one. So we're trying to build those systems in the kingdom that will help keep them from the evil one and Babylon. And, and um, so all of these threads and all of this discussion and these points that are being made are really, I mean, it's fascinating to me to watch them connect because these are the kind of discussions that will help others see what they're not able to see right now to connect it to scripture, to connect it to Jesus, what he said, what he did, how he lived, and then begin to own it to a degree where they're able to join us in what we're trying to do. So I'll just, I'll stop there. Yeah, that's, that's really good, Doug. And I, I you're bringing up this point again, which I uh, forgot to comment on, which was uh, Don's bringing up here in the weaponization. We have to wrestle down with the understanding of, hey, we the church are called to love people but we're called to war against the enemy. And part of that warfare and that why it's so important for us to really come out of Babylon, not pay it lip service or say it's impossible, is right in Revelations 6 through 8. So Revelation 6 through 8, I'll read it briefly, says this. Render to her, Babylon, just as she rendered to you, and repay her double, according to her works. In the cup which she has mixed, mix double for her. In the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure, give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as queen, I am no widow and will not see sorrow. So Babylon refuses to mourn, but part of working together with God once out coming out of Babylon is to be a part of judging Babylon. And I think we as believers don't understand that. We don't, we're not, well, that's God's job. Like, I don't have anything to do with it. Just as long as I don't get the plagues, that's all I care about. But what it's really is, God is saying is like, understand that the blood of your brothers and sisters are in Babylon, having been martyred by her. This is the evil forces that have gone throughout the earth. Um, and whether you realize it or not, those forces, principalities, and powers are your enemy, and they're God's enemy. And there's actually a purpose in, in warring against that. Now, we can't do that on our own. We can't do that out of lockstep. People get in trouble trying to do that stuff too. But 
The point is, in partnering with God, we have to take a position. And if we still have leaven in us, if we still have one foot in Babylon and one foot out, that in no way can we war against ourselves, right? That, that will always fail, um, as I think you can understand. So that's just super uh, important to remember and recognize. It's like, wait a second, I'm actually an enemy of these systems if I'm a friend of God. And so sometimes we get caught out like, well, am I, am I really an enemy of this? Well, I got to use the money anyway. And I, you know, I just got to be in the world anyway. So I just got to do what, when in Rome, do what the Romans do. So that's, that's a mistake. And this is why it's so hard to remain on the earth and come out of Babylon because it seems almost at odds with one another. Uh, and that's why I put in, and we can maybe shift the discussion uh, if we would to following up on last week's opening up of things, which is like, well, what, what is, what is more important in coming out of Babylon that I don't touch the filthy lucre and I never have currency in my wallet anymore? Or is that just religiousness? Or rather, is, it, is there a difference between partnership with Babylon and um, living in a Babylonian structure that is still is part of the ruling uh, and the governments that, that Jesus said you need to obey these leaders? Uh, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. That was the title of this discussion. So why is it that Jesus said, look, pay Caesar with Caesar's money? It, he would never say that if it was sinful, right? So Jesus wouldn't tell us, do something that's sinful. He's just saying, listen, take what is the system of the world and render it over here. Don't care too much about that. But what he is not saying is now go be a tax collector after you were a disciple, Matthew, or whoever was a tax collector, and go back and make an income because you can like take care of your family through Caesar um, and, 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 the, and the tax collectors. No, he's not saying that. So it's like, we need to look at, well, what's the difference between partnership, employment by, use of things, of being a consumer? There are different levels of involvement. And we don't see prohibition of a certain level of it, but we do see a prohibition of another level of it. And we need, and, and so one of the arguments I hear a lot is, well, Greg, we can't come out of Babylon like you're talking about, because like that would mean we'd have to just like completely evaporate and go somewhere else off of the earth. And we, we got to realize that, no, the meaning of what God is saying and coming out is not a religious meaning. It's not like a follow these 10 rules and then you're out. It's like, it's a heart matter. And the more we're entrenched and partnering with where there's strings attached that can pull on us, the worse we are in Babylon. So we need to realize that it's not an all or nothing like religious litmus test. It's a heart understanding and what causes me my slavery if I remain. As I said last time, you could take a pack of a $10,000 pack, a hundred dollar bills, light them on fire and gone is a hundred, one hundred dollar bills. There's no consequence to that. No one's going to enslave you because you did that. You just basically wrote off your lending that you did to the Federal Reserve. And there's no, that's not a, that's not an enslavement to you. But if you were like the pilgrims and you said, listen, I'm going to do this and that, you fund this and that, and then we're going to owe you forever to get out of this debt, whether it's a car or a mortgage or what have you, or any contractual obligation, by the way, it doesn't have to just be a debt. It can be a contractual obligation. Employment contracts can be very binding, for example. We need to watch out for that because if we're bound to Babylon through an employment contract, that can be just as bad as a debt contract or other contract or what have you. And also the issue that we talked about, which is when we own a piece of a company, we are in partnership, whether we want to admit it or not. We just are. That's just how it works. And you can illustrate it by saying if there's two owners and they're 50-50, well, they're each responsible for what the company does, um, morally, ethically, before God and everything else. So as we enter into contracts of owning pieces of companies, even limited partnerships, stocks, other contracts, we need to understand, like, are we tying ourselves into Babylon and are there strings 
attached to these legal contracts and sometimes what are often called covenants, which is another word for marriage. Um, I want to give Lucianne a chance to speak and then I'll go over to Don and DJ, okay? Lucianne, go ahead. You got your hand up. Just go ahead and unmute. Sorry, it just took me a minute because you were in a different mode on my phone. Um, so I guess I'm, I need to go back a little bit. I, I feel like a little bit is disjointed and I'm trying to track. Um, when, we're, when you read from Revelation 18, um, I think that that's important. So my life, a lot of my life work is in studying the harlot and teaching on that. Um, I was able to teach at the American Bible Society and help people through mythic images understand the harlot. So you're taking Babylon and you're dealing with the money system and, and so appreciate that. Sometimes the way we describe it is the Baal and the Asherah, Isis, Osiris, Allah, Allah, if you keep moving through the cultures and the art of the cultures you begin to see a pictorial understanding of the harlot in the ancient world, which she, and not, and according to Acts 19, that all of the world worshiped. So when we don't understand the historical connection to the harlot, and what I felt like the Lord led me to today was Isaiah 47. And the reason I wanna bring this up, I think it's important because what has been mentioned, which I tried to track, is first the love piece today was the most important takeaway so far, but that love of God over the love of this belief system. And by, of course, Ezekiel um, 28, by the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with darkness, uh, violence, and sin was found in you, speaking of the enemy. So when we're dealing with the enemy, the Baal and the Asherah, the, there's that male-female component. And I think we've lost sight of that piece. And the reason I believe God brought up Isaiah 47 to me again today was I want to just read these few things. Uh -huh. Isaiah 47, 5, sit silently and go into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you will no longer be called queen of kingdoms. I was angry with my people and I profaned my heritage and gave them into the, your hand. You did not show mercy to them. On the, on the aged, you made your yoke very heavy. Yet you said, I will be queen forever. These things you did not consider nor remember the outcome of them. Now then, hear this, you sensual one, who dwells securely, who says in your heart, I am and there is no one beside me. I will not sit as widow nor no loss of children. But these two things will come upon you suddenly in one day, loss of children and widowhood. They will come on you in full measure in spite of your many sorceries, in spite of the great power of your spells. And I won't continue on, but I hope others do. When we, uh, it has been mentioned today that our weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So when we're trying to come out of a system that has been created, <clears throat> we also have to understand this, how the system functions and the spiritual end of this aspect of the system, not just the, I wanna get out of debt aspect, the Ramsey measures, those are all good, they're practical, but the practical magic that's actually going on about us and hindering and enslaving people that piece, I think as believers, because we don't understand what's behind the Revelation 18 harlot riding on the beast in 17, there's a, a very important passage in 17 and it says that God has a purpose which is a common purpose with the beast. It's a scripture that literally I fought the Lord on for two years because I didn't get it. But his common purpose is to divide their kingdom. So when the common purpose with a beast is to, to take out what is taken out right after that is the harlot. So in prayer, in our weapons of warfare, understanding these un, this concept and this household, 
the household of the enemy, I believe is very critical to what we're talking about. It is an enslavement, but it's first enslavement spiritually. Then it's deception and all the other things that we fall in to pray into where we go into debt and things like that. So I just wanted to mention the spiritual side of what God's showing me today. And then I'll leave it at that. Yeah, that's really good. And I appreciate you saying that, especially the issue of understanding Babylon's relationship with the Antichrist um, mechanism. There, there's a dragon with 10 horns, and that's the Antichrist. And you can read elsewhere in Revelation about it. But then the harlot rides in on the dragon. So it's kind of like, oh, that's interesting. So they're all together. But then God judges the harlot through the other half, the dragon. Um, and that was his so that is his sovereign plan. Um, it's it's not a perfect analogy, but sometimes I, I say to people, one way to look at this, guys, is if the harlot represents unfettered capitalism and the dragon represents absolute control and even like Marxist communist influence, and it's not a perfect analogy, but they both were working together on the earth that are not of God. Um, one is all focused on the money and the profit and the, the luxury. The other one's focused on control and enslavement and um, getting people to come under a command or an obedience system that's not the Lord. So that's not perfect, but it gives you an idea like, oh, wait, yeah, so those both those things are really evil at its core. And the, the church of God has no business of being in either one. So we got to come out of both. Um, I wanted to, let's see, DJ wanted to go again, but was there anyone else who wanted to jump in who hasn't spoken yet? All right, DJ, go ahead. Uh, Eric, I want, I want Eric to... did you want to jump in? I'm sorry. I, I don't need to at this moment, but sure, if, if DJ wants to speak, that's fine. Why don't you, Merrick, go ahead and then we'll go to DJ. So um, great discussion. So it seems like where Mary and I are at right now is, is a bit contrary to the flow of, uh, of coming out of Babylon entirely. So in, in our married life, we have chosen to live debt free. So we've taken on no mortgage debt, no consumer loans, except that we would you know, roll it over monthly. So we, we've always been mindful of not being enslaved to it. Um, Interesting about this move to Keene is that we originally thought we would buy a house and that thing fell through. God just showed, made it very clear to us that we were not to buy that property. So we thought, well, maybe uh, he wants us to rent. So we chose to go look at some rentals and there were some, you know, unhealthy places. There were, there was one place that looked very possible and it was gone within 36 hours. We thought we might have a chance to see it. The following weekend, that is from Monday to Saturday, the first property we looked at actually came back in the market. The woman who initially won that contract um, walked away from it because she was just, it was a very difficult situation with her and the, and the listing broker, and he just couldn't take her anymore. So he just said, I can't deal with you anymore. I'm going to put this back in the market. So we looked at it. We liked it. We, we, we liked it in the first place. We made an offer on it back in uh, it was the first place we put an offer on, but it wasn't available to us since that woman uh, made the contract. So came back on the market. We said, well, maybe God wants us to buy this place. So we prayed about it and it seemed that there was that door was opening. So we now have this property under contract. So this will be our first mortgage debt situation uh, in our in our married life for 23, almost 24 years. So but we fully recognize the uh, the different levels you, you indicate, uh, Greg, about the prohibition. You know, we're not tied to Babylon yet. It seems like we're coming into a place where we're contractually entering into a, a non-recourse debt situation. But I think the, the overall picture is this. The Lord will do different things with, with different people at different times. And it looks like th there's no consistency with what God, how God works with us. Well, he's working with us individually. And his consistency is that he's bringing us through whatever he wants to bring us through um, for whatever season we're in. And I think he wants us to buy this property, to live in this neighborhood, which is near the, the state college. It's an old neighborhood in Keene. And to establish ourselves in a, a place where we can 
hopefully start a home group. So we feel very comfortable about buying this property, getting established there. I'm able to start my beehive again and you know, become a, a beekeeper more earnestly because we'll own property. And we can also garden like we haven't done before, the way we'd like to. So there's a whole different flow, different season in our life. And we feel that if we were to rent, we wouldn't have even the, the same status in that particular neighborhood where we're in. So that maybe that's not a major point, but the point is that we feel that we will have a stake in the well-being of that neighborhood if we're an owner in it. And so at some point in time, God may say, well, I want you to pay off this mortgage. That may be true. So again, different seasons for different things uh, with the same pur end purpose in mind, which is to fully come out. And we, we want to come out. Um, we just wonder uh, what that looks like down the road. And we're not going to worry about it because God's in charge of our lives. So uh, just throw that out there as a, you know, we're not, we want to be completely out. So at some point in time, we expect to be. So, Merrick, I really appreciate you bringing this up because you're being honest. You're not trying to uh, the, the avoid the discussion of it. You, you're just being uh, you know, truthful. And I think this brings up a huge issue. And we, we won't have time to go into it on this discussion, but we will have a topic about it, I'm sure, soon, which is home ownership. How do you go about it? Most Americans think the only way is to have a mortgage because it's so expensive. And of course, part of what we're doing in the new breed is exploring alternative lending through the storehouse strategy, whereby we, the Christian community, can back your mortgage, let's call it, but in a godly biblical way. Mm -hmm. One of the things you're going to run up against in uh, getting a mortgage, and my life is a testimony of it, is if you can't make your payment, there's all sorts of trouble and problem that comes your way. So those are the strings that get attached. Now, you know... Sure that you're going into it fully aware i can't sure. sit here and judge you this judge you that say this uh, let god work that out with you i i the only thing i can encourage you to do is don't shut down avenues that are unorthodox or unusual for how god could bring you home ownership in that home or any home and we have we're we've gone through this mess for 12 <clears throat> years we're still in our homes it's not explainable um, I can go into the details of that later. Um, we're not done yet with our persecutions of the original mortgage company that we did a mortgage with, with what was Washington Mutual back in 2003. Well, there's a whole history of who acquired that and then who sold to that. And then that got securitized and packagized. And we well, didn't get any help from the government or modifications from anybody. It's just been the Lord sustaining us. So that's an unusual way. And some people say, oh, that's dead wrong, Greg. You should never have done that. That's, that's not repaying your debts. And one thing I will say is this. When we're enslaved by a system that's not of God, it is a very different matter of not paying your debt or like getting out of debt than it is if you're borrowing from a believer, let's say, and you, you're just not paying your debt because you're just being, you're not being, you don't have any integrity. Right. In our, in our case, we didn't have the ability to service the debt. God did that by design. I didn't want that. I kicked and screamed on it. I <laughs> said, oh, it's going to ruin our credit score. Like, why would you not be able to let me pay these bills? And basically, the message was, Greg, you're a slave. You're a slave and you don't know it. And that's why I often use this analogy of the matrix, because that's a great, some people yeah. don't like the movie, they don't get it. But I... <laughs> <laughs> I, I always found it interesting because it's like a slavery system where Neo's working at his computer company and he's doing the daily grind and he's got his needs to pay his bills. But then all of a sudden he discovers, wait a minute, there's more than we think. There's more than this. this what is this matrix? And basically to me, that's like a parallel to what God is saying about the kingdom of God. Right. It is not the kingdom of the matrix or darkness or Babylon or whatever you want to call it. Sure. We can perceive it as it's the only way. There's no other way. You just have to have that job at Metacortex and you just have to have the life that you have and don't question it. Just do your thing. Like, and that's God is saying, no, my people bust out of the jail. I will help you. It's okay. 
And it's like there is a parallel here, and this is again a little bit controversial. There is of, of slavery. And was it wrong for a slave during the pre-Civil War era to escape from the South and come up to the North? Was that right or wrong? No problem. So, of course, there was a debate about that. In the South, it was illegal. And they made laws and passed laws that, oh, if you find a slave, you got to return him, you can't harbor him. But when we really press in and ask ourselves, wait a second, is it right in God's sight to come out of Babylon almost by all means necessary? And then you've got someone like Harriet Tubman who just exemplified that. She was a rebel against the system of slavery. Yep. And it's controversial and we could debate it later, but there's something there for us to ponder, trust me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see, DJ, go ahead. I want to speak to the uh, aspect of the strength of personal commitment. Um, my own father called me a pioneer. And uh, there's been several ways in my life, it seems like I, I was that fringe weird person doing something that everybody thought, else thought was crazy. Uh, one of the big things about coming out of Babylon is the aspect of people's health care. And my oldest will be 40. Uh, one of the weird things I, I started doing before or anybody talked about it was having my babies at home. So I had six children all, all in this home that I'm in right now. Um, the first one that I had in the hospital found out about it. They sent the police to my door at dawn. So it, it's a struggle to go against the system. And when God gives us a directive and uh, instruction, a co conviction inside of ourselves, I found he also gives us the strength. If we make that sold out, I'm totally in quality decision to throw in with God totally 100%. But that's what it takes. It takes, I am all in 100% and God will meet you because you'll be in a situation where obviously I can't handle this. I, you know, it's too much for me. And he has come in consistently, consistently to be my advocate, my shield, my provider. He has been there, but it takes a radical kind of quality life decision. Uh, the decisions that God has put in my heart had put me in a situation where I, not only did I struggle with the world, I struggled with my husband. So here's a man who wants to spend money and I am so committed to being debt free. Well, God came in and provided a bankruptcy for my husband. That was deliverance out of the system. And from that point on, there was a rearrangement of our finances. The other thing too, is I started homeschooling. My oldest will be 40. So I started homeschooling when he was two. People thought that was weird, you know, child abuse, illegal and all that. God put it on my heart. This is what he wanted me to do. Uh, once again, you know, the struggle. Now, thankfully with that, my husband was on board with that. But the rest of the world, the, uh, and, and it's, it's not just the world, it's the church too. What you're doing is wrong. Uh, and then you have the financial element on top of it. Why don't you go back to work? We're making good money. You know, what are you doing here? Just wasting your time, staying at home with your kids. So I fought that as well. Um, but it's, it's been the whole thing about making that quality decision. Now, I was determined to stay home with my children. I had six children. I wanted them. Uh, the Lord had put in my heart that he wanted me to be with them to the point of homeschooling them. And so that meant I was committed to live on my husband's income. Um, people told me he had a good job at General Electric. All right, it was better than most. But when I went into GE for budget counseling as a, a beneficiary to, um, you know, like a benefit that people got from GE, uh, I presented, I could not believe what they were telling people how to live. And this is where the world system just keeps us indoctrinated to stay stuck. And even when you supposedly are seeking help, you can't go to the world system and ask the world system how to get out of the world system. Because <laughs> when I sat there and I listened to their budget counseling, and that was, 
you couldn't even go to the budget counseling until you did, had big manila envelope and filled out all these forms about you know where your money's going and all that most stuff that people don't do which is why they're in trouble to begin with and then then they gave you this two and a half hour class and i'm sitting there thinking what you're saying is absolutely crazy i'm sorry but i can do math in my head i was running a ledger on green paper with a pencil so i could stay home with my children i'm looking for just one more idea to make it a little bit better and they're telling me basically here's how you're supposed to live here's an example then they didn't even follow the example most people were asleep within an hour and i was enraged i'm thinking how can you be telling me this is how Americans are living? This is absolutely crazy. Right. So I, I, I said, I want my appointment right away. Well, they mm. made, it made me wait. I said, here's my budget. The first thing they said to me was, oh my gosh, your budget balances. Yeah, that, it, it, what, I, what I would say, um, to DJ, if, well, go ahead and finish your story. Okay, this is how the world thinks. This is why we have to get with God, get his mind and do things his way. But when he tells us how he wants us to do it, be prepared to not match the world and they're not going to like it. They're not going to like it. I was told that what I was doing in the budget I supposedly proposed was impossible. I said, no, it's not impossible. I live on this. I live on this. I make this happen. This so, is what I'm trying to say. This is the mentality I'm trying to get across. So this this is really important, I think, to summarize what you're getting at is beware of trying to do half this or half that because you can get frustrated. And I think that's why God said, no more debt and do not turn to man for help. Because as soon as you that, go to a government that. program or you go to a person who says, listen, I'll lend you the money, but I'll put all these strings right. attached to it. Uh, you know, you could get this government program and help, but you got to conform this way, that way, and the other way. And so uh, for better or for worse, it is uh, sometimes though difficult, worth when you trust God, go all the way, don't have plan Bs, fallback plans, I'll do half this, half that. It can right. lead you in a vulnerable position where it's even harder in some ways. And well, a lot I, of people- I want to end with this. I want to end with this. I want to end with us adopting, we have a can-do attitude with the Lord. No matter what he tells us to do, no matter how crazy it seems, no matter how much persecution we get, we can do it. And what I remember is, I'll end with this, a joke. A joke is asteroids coming to the earth, they look up, they say, we have three days and this asteroid is going to hit the earth. There's going to be a giant tsunami. I know this isn't biblical. It's going to cover the earth with flood. Everybody's going to drown. So all the religious leaders get together. They're addressing their flocks. The, the Pope's telling their, his flock, uh, well, you know, get right with God and, and pray your prayers and get ready to meet your maker. The, 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 Grand uh, Muftas and Imams are telling their flock, you know, uh, the faithful of Allah, get right with Allah, submit and uh, get ready to meet your maker. Uh, <laughs> so, you sorry, could you help us understand what you mean? Anyway, I want to give it over to Don. Okay, um, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Please okay. don't cut me off. So the Jewish rabbi gets up and says to his flock, well, we have three days to figure out how to live underwater that's the attitude people that's the attitude okay. all right don are you still there yeah i'm still here and i really appreciate that the, the one thing that i want to say to throw out for consideration is when we're this is what's been my heart for about 18 years but i kicked and screamed when god took me into business because i was a pastor and a church planter and 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 somebody who the people that grew went out and started ministries and businesses and all these things and it's like oh okay I see how this rolls but I came out of a waste hour wilderness there was a war over my soul you guys probably know the whole story it's absolutely horrific multiple suicide attempts people having to physically pin me down take me protect me I was so completely deceived because my mother was a high ranking witch Wiccan and I was groomed in the occult and very active in it at a young age so when god brought me out there was an absolute complete warfare down to the 
death. I was tormented day and night by demonic powers. When God brought me out of that, he, when he healed me up, just reading the Bible eight to 12 hours a day, I was literally fit to be tied. I was so hostile against the powers of hell for what they had done to me and to, done to other people. He took it from that point. So this, this ongoing hostility against the powers of hell has been born out of deep personal experience. When you're deceived to the point that you think you that you are told you have to kill yourself to offer yourself as an offering to God for him to accept you in eternity, that is even further than Martin Luther going up and going on peas in his shoes and all that kind of crap. That's down to you have to kill. It's like a suicide bomber. That's how deceived I, I was. So the point is, is that this is this is out of that background. Now, the thing about this is that coming in one practical thing that's been in my heart. And it's born out of the life's vision, but it's that when we, when, if we leave all these, let's say business partnerships, for instance, it's unequal yoke. We leave these debt covenants. We leave all these things. When we come into something in the kingdom of God, what is our relationship to God and his, in his provision, his wealth? What is our relationship to each other with that provision and wealth? And about 12 years ago, I was with a group of guys. I still occasionally visit with them, fellowship deeply. And God brought me, he said, fellas, half of you are millionaires. <clears throat> God has put on my heart that we should take 10 to a hundred dollars each, something that's like pocket change for everybody here, put it into a pool, pray on it and ask God to grow something out of that. And the two things were, yes, it would be a service project or a nonprofit, but one of it was a business. We didn't know what it was. It was owning, not co-oping, owning the business straight down the line. For instance, of the 10 guys, 10% each, drafting up these kind of documents. Greg is talking about, got to give me some of these documents. They were, they were operating agreements and they modeled the kingdom. And what happened is the guys were scared out of their mind because they had brought me in to be an interim chief financial officer, by the way. God, when he took me, instead of going to the school of world missions to get a, to fit, to, to, to get a, a doctorate in missiology, and he took me into business, I went kicking and screaming for four years. It took five, six years just to get into business school, then go on to become a CPA, work for Warren Buffett's companies, largest companies in the world, $200 billion budgets and all this. I've dealt with all that. Forensic investigations, people are in jail today because of what I've done, blah, 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 blah. Point is, is that the Egyptians have gotten a bit spoiled. Can, but I hate can you, the, can I, you I hate summarize it. it in a minute or the two? Summarizing though? is this. We need to come. One of the things that I see, we have to own the means of revenue generation together. We don't really. Let me ask this. How many of you right now, and you probably do, how many of you actually own legally on, not your family members, not your wife, not your children, outside, not your brother-in-law, not your sister-in-law that God has specifically on purpose caused you to come together. And the reason why these guys were scared was because of the spiritual and where God would take the relationship because they were coming out of something, but they had to come into something. This is going to go to my mind beyond things that just let us bring our peace to it. It's got to go beyond that. And that scares People to the point, because that's when I see mammon, one of them really sticks up its, its hackles. And it's like, because this guy's going to take all I got. He, he's going to get the better end of the stick. He's going to be a slouch and a slough in that. Well, let's vet each other out then. Let's vet each other out just like if we were going to hire each other. Let's hire each other. Let's hire each other in the kingdom of God. And go into this thing and test this thing out. Because what, what's the worst you're going to do? Put in a hundred bucks. Start praying about it. Own it. Draw, draft up those things. Let's give God something to work with. I, Doug, or others, you may have already done this. I have tested this out with multiple people and they draw back at that point because they think, oh, this is like a communism. There's every excuse in the book. We own each other's blood. We, we, we belong. We are bone of bone and flesh of flesh. God owns our blood. We own each other's blood. First Corinthians 3, 21. I finished with this. Paul said, all things are yours. Whether Paul, Cephas, Apollos, the world, things present, things past, all things. And people say, Tom, this is taking it too far. Well, guess what? The devil's taken it too far. He has destroyed everything. Babylon's taken it too far. How deep do we think this thing goes on God's side? 
This thing goes all, as you've all said, it goes all the way in to the kingdom, to the point where we are going to live, breathe, and die for God and one another. That is going to come to that. Some of us are literally going to die for each other. We are going to physically lay down our lives for our brothers. So we shouldn't be surprised that God's going to bring us into these simple things. And you guys can comment. I just haven't been tied to it. I, I'd really be interested in going that way. And vet us all out. Yeah, get all our crap out of the way and all that. Yeah. Use wisdom and all the things we need to do. But like to GJ's point, let's do it. Let's let's cut the ribbon. Let's strike some ground, put the shovel in the dirt and do something simple. And this might not be the right way to do it. I don't know. But that's how I've tried to do it with a few people. And they're scared and they draw back. And these are people that have lost hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars on terrible, greedy investments. But yet they can't put 10 to 100 bucks with other Christians because it's a spiritual thing. Yeah. It's a common yeah. thing. So I will, this is really a topic for the storehouse discussion. Um, and we'll, we'll do in another another take but yes the what you're talking about is a real dynamic and we've got to deal with that and the individualism and the resistance to it but i'm convinced that through the church and i'm talking about the unified church the bride of christ uh, and through the jesus's leadership structure of eldership of fivefold ministers um of other leaders and it, there is a way we can enter into this um, where it's not that spirit of man and trying to tear us apart at every turn. Um, and so we're committed in the storehouse project to do these 10, like what 10 cities would like to try this. And if you've already done it, like we've done it here, try it again and let's see what happens. Let's learn some lessons. Let's come together in a community. Let's share with how's it going and what's working and what's not. Because it's not going to be easy, but God's got to take us not only out of Babylon, but then into the kingdom. And as you said in the beginning, it's a monarchy. Jesus is the head. It's not a, it's a, not a democracy. And so what does that look like? Well, it looks like the kingdom of God and, 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 and um, the structure of the church. And we need to say that, look, there is a real discipling school of the prophets, rabbinic learning, all of the ways of God are the tools and equipment we, we need to be able to be successful. Because if we don't do that and we just try to come up with something else, it'll fail. It won't work. We'll try to kill each other. People will go after each other's throats. And that's, that's not what God's doing. It's, it's really this idea of preparing the church to enter in to what God wants to do in the future forever. And are we willing to do that? Are we willing to take that stance? So divorcing Baal and Mammon to me is critical because you've got you to take that step of repentance, um, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then, um, you know, this, this dynamic of like practically, what does it mean? How do we escape the slavery? Because if we're not, if we can't come out of the slavery, we'll just keep fighting each other. And, you know, it'll be, it'll be the Israelites all over again, fighting each other and complaining about Egypt was better. And so Babylon is not better, but it seems that way when we think we have its spoils or what have you. So anyway, listen, this has been great. Um, we're coming up on the top of the hour at 10 o'clock. Does anybody else have a parting thought? And then maybe I can ask uh, uh, someone who hasn't spoken to close us in prayer. I see Jonathan Serenale, you're on the line. Brother, um, how's your wife and family doing? Do you have a newborn here with us? Yeah, actually, uh, yeah. One of the reasons why I haven't been able to get on the past couple of months. Got a newborn and um, I'm pl plus the other boys we already had. So we got five boys in the house, not including me. So it gets kind of busy especially at night and early in the morning, even throughout the night, but yeah, it's been good. Awesome. Hey, I uh, really appreciate you and your wisdom. Do you have anything to contribute or we'll just uh, close up in prayer? You know, I was, I'm really, uh, as you know, I'm really um, excited and interested in this, um, this topic and this conversation. I wanted to get on last week, uh, it just didn't work out, but I try to get on as much as I can today. Um, I was only able to catch the tell of this 
but um you know i I don't know. Maybe we're going to have another. Are you going to continue this conversation next week or anything? Yeah, we're, we'll continue the conversation. It'll probably be a different topic or thrust, but um, okay. Prop, you know, we, we could talk offline about like what what are some of your ideas or things or thoughts or questions. Sure, so, sure, yeah. Contact me. Yeah, I know it's the end of this, and I don't want to. I don't want to get on and, and carry on. But I, I, bottom line, like what I did here from the end is just more about the posture of one's heart as opposed to actually legally or illegally doing things according to the commands of God or word of God, but more about just uh, the humility of a people that would come together and submit and unite under the, just uh, the simple fact of, Hey, we love God and God loves each of us and, and one another. And so we want to begin to one, uh, a love, a love one another and to submit to one another. And when we see that kind of unity, I think we'll see, a lot of what we're talking about and much of what y'all have been talking about that I mean, I've even heard a lot of that will just happen. Um, and, um, uh, it'll be automatic. It won't be something that we have to come up with. It'll just be like, Hey, that's natural. I, I just want to give or, or, uh, share with my brethren and things like that. So I, I just, uh, point back to humility, which is what I'm sure y'all have been talking about this whole time. Yeah. Amen. It's almost like it's better to start with, um, not a group of business people um, who are looking to like the next new thing of making a company and profit, but it's rather a prayer and unity movement of how are we coming together and worship and trusting God and loving on him and loving on each other. And then out of that, it's going to be very natural to do some of these other things. Amen. So, um, Amen. And not only that, I mean, I think the, the business part is great, but you know, um, and I think that's so- sorely needed, but even a bunch of paupers and a bunch of people that have been cast aside and people that have been overlooked uh, for not only their lives, but even generations, whether it be a particular type of people or sides of towns or cities. But when you see those people come together, love one another, unite, and then you see some of these great uh, business ideas and things come out of that, it's even more glory to God when it's like, Hey, I mean, it, it was one thing for a bunch of geniuses to get together and come up with a great idea and, and they had, they united that. That's awesome. But when you see a bunch of people that everyone uh, wrote off or overlooked or even yeah. considered to be worthless, come up with that. It's like, whoa, I mean, who, who was this other than a God that was able to one, unite them, but then bring about this uh, tremendous victory. So I think that's awesome. Yeah. Amen. So uh, remind us all and the people who are listening, um, your house of prayer, and initiative in uh, San Antonio is called what again now? Uh, it's Mission City. Mission We're in San Antonio, City. Texas. And in fact, we've been after a uh, five-fold ministry, an apostolic ministry center, whatever you want to call it, a refuge, um, all founded on the Tabernacle of David. And so we've been doing some prayer room hours already for the past year and a half since we've opened. But actually on Monday, which is the uh, beginning of the Hebrew New Year, we're actually set to be able to start and officially public publicly say we're open for so many hours a day eventually trying to be 24 7 so we'll be like a, a somewhat of an official uh, whatever however that looks uh, prayer room that's open consistently monday through friday so it's gonna be awesome amen yeah so i wanted to highlight for everybody here you can find out more about what they're doing in san antonio with uh, uh, jonathan we did two interviews with Jonathan, it's right on the website. I can put in the chat here. But if you go to newbreed.co, it's got all the links to Mission City, to the interview, to the discussion. It was really rich. Um, you've been a pioneer in doing this. That's why I appreciate you uh, so much, Jonathan. So um, I appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Bert. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Uh, so check it out. Uh, if you search on the website, little search box in the website you can find it but i'm also going to stick it right here um and just for anybody that would um for the next like two or three days our website is being revamped so the website may not work but everything else should be up and working but give us at least a few days great yeah and then we have the apostolic centers uh was part two Okay, so hey, uh, anybody else want to uh, uh, close close us in prayer today? Anybody feel led to do that? And Don wanted to pray for marriages, so let's do that too. Um, 
Don, go ahead and close us. Father, we thank you for all that you've brought forth through us today. Truly, that treasure, that inheritance is in your saints corporately. Jesus, you're our hope of glory. We thank you for taking all this and that book of remembrance that those who fear the Lord spoke often to one another that was written and you'll remember when you make up your jewels. So Lord, we pray that you would take this and bring this to pass. This which you have brought out of our hearts, bring it back as it were down into us and cause it to be established spirit, soul, and body on every level over this earth that you've given us dominion over. We haven't yet seen the full measure but cause the blade to press up, cause all that's been done with the storehouse, our relationships, our marriages. Lord, draw the marriages together and Lord, give mercy to glue these husbands and wives together, these children and siblings together, friends and relationships. And Lord, grace us to be severed from every entanglement of this world and to be fully bonded, glued, cemented, and adhered with the eternal unifying power of your spirit in us from of the kingdom of God, that we might enter fully into the life of the kingdom. We thank you for hearing and answering everything we're crying to you for. We receive it by faith, and we step forward and breathe every breath with every step by faith in you. We trust you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, great being with you all, and thank you for contributing and sharing. Um, we are a learning community, and uh, God has the answers. So appreciate each one of you guys. Love you, and we'll see you soon, okay? Have a good one. God bless you guys. Yeah.